I would like first to, of course, uh, thank you, uh, the organizers and the coordinators of the meeting <coughs> for uh, the invitation to present uh, my work. And this is really a, a very amazing uh, conference with very, very interesting talks. Uh, and also the, the, the meetings before uh, I did the homework, look online, uh, so watch some of the videos. <coughs> very, very nice work. So, uh, as um, my, my talk today is going to be about some work we have been doing trying to model uh, nanoparticle superlattices. Uh, and actually, I, my group is not coming from the field of colloidal self assembly or crystallography. We are more, uh, more into soft matter problems, looking at polymer, uh, surfactants, uh, self assembly of soft materials in general. Um, something like three years ago, we decided we were looking to the interaction of uh, surfaces modified by polymer brushes, uh, and from there we decided we wanted to understand the uh, assembly of nanoparticles. And so, uh, one of my PhD students started to look at and, and this problem. And it's really very, very interesting things going on there. So, uh, everything I'm going to show you today is, is something that we did in, in the last three years. Uh, so the way I, I like to introduce this topic to the general public is uh, to think about nanoparticle superlattices uh, in terms of size as intermediates between atomic crystals and colloidal crystals. Uh, but of course that, uh, even though we know very well the rules that uh, control self-assembly of atomic crystals and colloidal crystals, there is still a lot of, of, of uh, things that we don't know about uh, nanoparticle superlattices. So uh, you, ca you cannot get information on this one. Uh, uh, there, there are no uh, really um, connection between self-assembly here and, and, and the other two streams of, uh, of length scales. And, and the reason for that is that there are some truly nanoscopic defects going on in nanoparticle superlattices that has to do with its, uh, has, to with, has to do with the fact that in uh, nanoparticles the size of, of the ligands, the thickness of the ligand layer is similar in size to the radius of the core. And so those are some nanoscopic uh, important effects. So uh, today I'm going to focus on a very specific type of nanoparticle superlattices that are those made of uh, inorganic nanocrystals coated with uh, alkanophile ligands. Uh, there are, of course, many other types like uh, superlattices made uh, with DNA ligands. Uh, today my talk is going to be about this special type of systems. And the idea here is that you can uh, do self-assembly just by taking a solution or a suspension of these nanoparticles in an organic solvent uh, which is a good solvent for the ligands, and then you let it evaporate, and at some stage in the evaporation process, there will uh, be the formation of some long order structure, okay? Uh, and then, of course, you remove the, the remaining solvent and get to the dry superlattices. Uh, now, of course, there are a lot of uh, work done in trying to understand how the properties of the building belong relate to the uh, final structure of the system. But my, I want to make the claim here that in, in this uh, intermediate structure where you still have solar in the system, <clears throat> it's not only the properties of the building block, but also the, the, the properties of the solvent and the content of the solvent that make, uh, can uh, determine the, the structure of the system. And then, of course, there is also the question of kinetics, right? Okay, so at what moment during this process uh, the final structure is locked, is frozen, and cannot uh, switch from one phase to the other anymore? I'm not going to address kinetics today, but I, I will try mainly to focus on the role of the solvent. Uh, I also will address a very simple system in terms of composition, uh, just uh, one single component nanoparticle superlattice. Uh, and if you have spherical particles that are high spheres, then you expect those to pack into uh, the, the structure with the highest packing fraction, like FCC or ACP. Uh, but what happens in the, is that in a lot of experiments with nanoparticles, you get, for example, VCC. So it's a no glove packing structure, right? And this also happens, of course, in binary superlattices, where if you uh, would expect to have the, the structure with the highest packing fraction, so in this plot, uh, I just wrote from a paper, you have the packing fraction as a function of, of the ratio of the sizes of the particles. And the, the structure that will be uh, the most stable one for higher spheres will be just moving over this dashed red line. Uh, but then you look at the experiments and you have points all over the place, okay? So, of course, the, the conclusion here is that the crystals are not high spheres, the ligands play a role. Uh, and there is this very nice paper that actually uh, shows that 
you can uh, have some universal behavior if you look at this softness parameter lambda, which is the ratio between the thickness of the ligand and the radius of the core. And uh, if you plot, um, if, if you look at the structure as a function of lambda, then there is a threshold value of 0.7. Everything above that uh, goes to VCC, and everything below that goes to FCC. Um, this, of course, is done for a specific system called nanoparticles coated with alkanophile ligands. Uh, but anyway, this, this somehow kind of solves the problem of, of how the, the uh, properties of the building block are related to the final structure. But there is one issue here. This is done for the final dry super lattice. Now, there are these uh, two experiments from different papers that actually show that there is another way to trigger the transition between FCC and VCC, and that is by controlling the amount of solvent in the system. So, for example, in this particular one, the dry super lattice is, uh, has a structure that is BCT, which is a body centered tetragonal. Is, uh, I, I want to talk about in, in a few minutes, but that's an intermediate in terms of a structure between BCC, body center cubic, and FCC, body center cubic. Uh, for now, let's say that this is something that is close to BCC. And then as you start swelling the system, <coughs> using uh, octane vapor, there is a transition from BCT to FCC, and this is reversible, right? So you can go back and forth. Uh, there is this other paper that is related. So in, in this particular case, they started with FCC uh, in a, in, and, and let it dry and look at the structure of the system over time. And what happens is that you have FCC and then there is a transition as you dry to BCC. Everything in between is, is uh, actually also BCT, okay? But I think these two, these two examples show very well that solvent plays a role and that you control the structure of the system with the solvent too. So uh, we decided, based on this, we decided to start looking at, at the problem of uh, how the amount of solvent um, affects the structure. And so we, we developed this theory for uh, nanoparticle super lattices, which uh, I will try to give you an idea. So don't have too much time to explain all the details, but also I want to give you some general idea, mostly because this is very different from, let's say, molecular dynamic simulation, so you can get the feeling of uh, what's going on here. Uh, the way this is done is you start by writing down uh, a functional for the free energy of the system that you propose. Uh, this, actually, in, in this particular case, this, this free energy is very simple, has only three terms. So, for example, the first term is the transitional entropy of the solvent, so the solvent is, is there. Uh, and this is done, it's, it's important to know, this is done for the narrow particles are fixed in the space. The inorganic core behaves like a hard solid, so the solvent cannot enter, the ligands cannot enter in, in, in that region where the inorganic core is. Uh, and then um, the, the ligands and the solvent are treated in, in a mean field way uh, between the particles, right? And in, for example, in, in this particular term, uh, there are this function rho s, that is the density of the solvent in each point of space. That's something that, that I probably don't know what it is, so you need to calculate, you need to find that. This, this is an unknown, okay? Uh, then this other term is, is the conformational entropy of the ligands. Uh, here there is an unknown function that is PS alpha, that is the probability of having a certain ligand in a certain conformation that is given by alpha. So what we do is we generate a lot of different uh, conformations for the ligands uh, using some Monte Carlo algorithm, and we fit the theory with that. And the theory decides what is the probability of each of those conformations uh, on the surface of the nanoparticle. Uh, and then we have a term that's related to the core-core uh, van der Waals interactions. Uh, I have to say this is, uh, all of this is, is a coarse grain model, so we don't have atomistic detail, but we still have some control over the chemistry in, 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 in the sense that uh, we have explicit description for the ligand, so we can decide the, the length of the ligand or the grafting density. So there is some chemistry there, but there is still some, uh, this is a coarse grain model. Uh, and we have one uh, extra contribution that is uh, an incompressibility constraint that means that in each point of the space we have either solvent or ligands or because this is a mean field, some combination of both, but we cannot have like free volume, okay? Uh, so we can model well lattices very well but not dry super lattices. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'm going to show you some results uh, that go beyond this approximation. But for now, this is something we have. Uh, okay, so we have all of this. What we do is just we minimize, uh, do a functional minimization of the free energy with respect to unknowns. 
we put that into the computer, we solve the problem, and from there we get two things. We get a structured information, we, so we, we have some uh, distribution of, of the ligand and the solving the system, and we get uh, more dynamical information. Uh, so for the structural information, for example, okay, all of this is, we have densities in, in the 3D space, so we need to make cuts or find some way to plot this. This is just a cut along one plane of uh, FCC cell, and, and uh, what I'm showing you here is, is the density of, of the ligands in different uh, positions of the space. We can look at problems like interpenetration or, or see if the ligand layer is deformed. Uh, and this is thermodynamics. So this is uh, basically a plot of the difference of uh, inferior energy between VCC and FCC as a function of the amount of solvent in the system. So because there is an incompressibility constraint as, as you uh, decrease the amount of solvent, the super lattices should shrink, so the, the lattice parameter should decrease. And here I will always show you some bars showing which, which structure is a stable one in different conditions. So what we get here is a transition from uh, FCC, so this is a prediction for a theory, it's a transition from FCC where the uh, super lattice is swollen with solvent to VCC when it's not, and that's basically uh, what they found in the experiment. So th this transition, we get it okay, okay? Uh, and something that is interesting also is that we look to a even simpler system that is this one formed by a very uh, long, infinitely long uh, Rods, uh, it's actually a two-dimensional system because, as I say, this is very long rods. And in this particular case, we also see a transition between, in this case, this hexagonal structure that would be closed pack if these were uh, hard bodies to this square one. So I, I, I do believe there is some generality here uh, in terms of this transition between something that would be closed pack when you have solvent to something that is not when you don't. This is something we, we are working on. But maybe uh, this may be interesting to look at that problem in, in binary super lattices, for example, and see if you were the same. And we can also look at, at this problem of the softness parameter and see if the theory also captures it okay. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the, for the super lattices in this paper, you got the transition at lambda equal 0.7. So of course, no lambda will depend, the, the lambda required for the transition will not depend on the amount of solvent because by changing the amount of solvent, lambda is fixed, but the transition shifts. So what I have to do is to plot uh, the lambda for the transition as a function of the amount of solvent. This is the, the volume fraction of solvent in, in the whole lattice. Uh, and you can calculate actually lambda in two different ways. You can uh, change the radius of the particle uh, uh, but keep fixed the length of the ligand or you can change the length of the ligand and keep fixed the radius of the particle. That's two ways of, of changing lambda. And both of them give more or less the same results. Uh, and something that is uh, nice about that is if you, we extrapolate to zero, amount, to zero solvent here, we get something like 0.5, which is not that far away from 0.7. So I think this is also, even though, of course, the, the chemistry here may play a role and, and there may be some differences between uh, different inorganic core, for example, I, I think there is some generality there too in, in, in what you get. All right, so I, I would like now to go back to this problem of uh, BCT. So as I mentioned before, uh, BCT and, and uh, BCC are not exactly the same. Uh, and in most experiments, the BCT, show, the BCT phase shows up between BCC and FCC. So in, for example, take this particular example, you have FCC when the nanoparticle, when the super lattice is swollen and then it goes to BCC, but everything in between is BCT. Just to give you, uh, if, if, uh, to explain this a little bit better, uh, the way uh, you should think about that is if you take the FCC cubic cell with four nanoparticles per cell, uh, you can define another cell that has two nanoparticles per cell, that is the one in green here. Uh, that one uh, is not cubic anymore, it's tetragonal, and it has a, a relationship between C and A of square root of two. And then if you start compressing this, this cell, when you get to C over A equal one, then uh, that's VCC, and everything in between is VCT. So and this is known as, as the vein transformation. So there is a continuous structural transformation between FCC and, and BCC. Now the question is, uh, if you look at the thermodynamics of the problem, does it mean that you have uh, this as, as, as an intermediate or it may be just jump directly from uh, FCC to BCC because the, this is not thermodynamically stable. So that's exactly what we look at in the theory. So we, uh, 
added some calculations using different values of C over A that uh, correspond to different uh, BCT structures. Uh, and what we got was uh, that none of those structures was stable in, in were stable in, in, in those conditions. So meaning that uh, our theory predicted a transition from BCC to FCC, no stable BCT in between. And, and that was bad at the moment because uh, that was not uh, what you see in the experiments. Uh, so we decided, instead of just quitting, we decided to uh, look at the difference between the experiments and the theory. So asking us the question, what is the difference? Uh, at this point, we were doing calculations for spherical nanoparticles in bulk superlattices, and the experiments uh, are done for thin films, and also, of course, the nanoparticles are not spherical. So we try to, to look at these two uh, differences uh, individually to see if one of them can explain the formation of BCT. All right, so the first one we look at was the effect of the, the surface. So we took just three layers of nanoparticles and we sandwiched them between two surfaces. And so in this, uh, in this phase diagram over here, I'm showing you the density of the solvent and the distance between the nanoparticles and the surface. Uh, and you see a lot of uh, BCC, a lot of FCC, but only two points were predicted to be BCT. So this means that even though this, the surface may stabilize BCT, I don't think they can really explain all the, I mean, you really get a lot of experiments showing BCT phases in nanoparticle superlattices. Almost none in, in, in large micrometer size spheres, in, in uh, colloidal crystals of micrometer uh, size particles, but uh, in, in superlattices made of uh, nanoparticles with that kind of higher ligas, they show up a lot. So we believe this is not the right explanation, so we look at the the problem of the non-spherical shapes. This, uh, the nanoparticles used in this experiment had a, a cubo-octahedral shape, similar to a truncated octahedral. And uh, what we did is we just took the orientation of the particles from the experiment because we, we had to fix that and we didn't want to, uh, it was difficult to explore all the configuration space, so we took the orientation. And again, we look at the free energy of, of the different potential structures, and we got a lot of BCT uh, phases in that case. I think it's fair to, to look at this IRM. Again, we have the amount of solvent, and now in, in this axis, there is a parameter that controls the shape of the particle. And right now, you see there is a lot of, uh, lot of points in, in this phase diagram that corresponds to BCT. So we believe that this really is an explanation of, of, of why BCT is stabilized. We try to understand this a little bit better. Again, sometimes it's difficult with this kind of model to understand the reason of, of the problem because all the information is there, but you need to find a way to extract it. In this case, what we did is we look at the pair potential between uh, nanoparticles, which is an approximation that may work, or may not work, but in this case, we checked and, and it did work rather well. And uh, the idea here is that there are two different types of interactions, so they can, the nanoparticles can interact through this hexagonal facet or through this square facet. And if you look at the pair potential between these two interactions, they are of course different. They will be exactly the same for spherical nanoparticles, but for the ones are, are different. Uh, and now this um, center to corner potential is a little bit more repulsive than the center to center interaction potential, and we believe that what makes, makes the symmetry of the system and makes this to, uh, to, to achieve a tetragonal uh, distortion, right? Uh, again, this is just a geometrical effect. You don't need any difference in the chemistry of, of the facet. It's just because of the geometry of, of the particles. All right, so uh, let me use the last minutes to uh, go back to this, this approximation, the approximation of uh, incompressibility. As I said before, this basically uh, forbids us to look at uh, dry superlattices because we cannot have a free space, we cannot have uh, voids in, in our uh, system. And of course, it is a problem if we want to look at, at the whole process of evaporation because then you have to go from the wet superlattice to the dry superlattice. Uh, so what we did is we, we formulated a different version of the theory. We, we just changed the the terms, the contributions that we have in the equation. Uh, we don't have the incompressibility constraint anymore, but we added some terms that describe now uh, explicitly the interactions between the solvent molecules and the solvent and the ligas. 
So we added the term that's for the, uh, the repulsions. This is just using some uh, high sphere functional. And then uh, the Van der Weyss interaction, Lenarchon, the attractive branch of the Lenarchon interactions uh, for, the, for the attractions. And then because now we want to be able to tune the amount of solvent in the system, we need some handle to do that. Uh, so instead of using a canonical ensemble for uh, the free energy, we're using a grand canonical ensemble and, and we have this term, uh, this is the chemical potential of the solvent, so we can tune that up and down and, and, and with that control the amount of solvent in the system. Uh, just by using these, these terms, for example, if you have a system with tonal particles, this will predict uh, a very basic uh, li um, liquid gas transition. So basically we hope this can predict uh, the drying process. All of this is actually something that uh, is still unpublished. We, we're still working a little bit on that. And again, we get uh, structural information and thermodynamical information. So the thermodynamical information looks like that. So we have uh, in this plot the excess free energy as a function of the lattice parameter. And each of these curves corresponds to a different value of the chemical potential of the solvent. So when the chemical potential of the solvent is, is very small, you have almost no solvent in the system, and you have this very strong minimum, about 1,000 kVc for the, the unit cell. Uh, so basically, uh, this is the dry super lattice. Everything is, is uh, the attraction is very strong. And then you start increasing the chemical potential of the solvent, and this minimum will uh, get less negative and will shift to larger lattice parameter. If you increase it too much, it will eventually disappear, and that's when the, uh, the lattice is not stable anymore. And this is some structural information. Again, it's difficult to plot sometimes because you need to plot three-dimensional information, but uh, this is the density of the ligand. You can see very well when the... Uh, so each, each of these snapshots correspond to one uh, of the minimums on, on this uh, plot. Uh, when the system is swollen, meaning that this is minimum on a row here for the black curve, you see very well the, the spherical symmetry of the ligand layer. And in these other plots, I'm showing you the density of the, of the solvent, so there is solvent uh, here, and then when it collapses, it's not solvent anymore. All right, so uh, what do we can do with this? Well, we decided to try first if to check the approximation that we use in, in the other theory, with this incompressibility constraint. And that approximation will basically tell you that if you start with a super lattice that is uh, swelling with solvent, uh, there will, and, and you want to go to a dry super lattice, then the first step will be first to uh, freeing the, the lattice. That, of course, will expel solvent from the system. But uh, if you look at, let's say, the density of the solvent in the voids, that should be more or less constant because there is this compressibility constraint. You don't have uh, ligands here. Uh, so the only thing that you can have is uh, solvent, all right? Uh, so if you plot that, let's say we, we plot the density of the solvent in, in the voids. I just, in this case, I, I pick some particular uh, tetrahedral voids in the VCC super lattice as a function of the lattice parameter. So this pathway will involve first to compress the super lattice, but keeping the density of the solvent fixed or more or less fixed. And then at the end, we just will dry the super lattices and, and the density of the solvent will go down. There is another pathway you can imagine that's actually the opposite one. So you first dry the, the solvent in the voids and then you collapse the super lattice. And of course, probably the reality is none of those is something in between, but we wanted to ask the question, okay, wh which one is better to describe uh, the system? Okay, and this one of course will, will be the opposite, right? So you first uh, dry and then you collapse. And these are the predictions of the theory. Basically, uh, is I would say closer to the first one. So first, uh, you decrease, you shrink the super lattice. Of course, again, each of these points correspond to different value of the chemical potential. You are losing solvent all the way. Uh, and then you first, as I said before, you first collapse and then you, you dry, okay? So uh, this was good for us because it means that the, the first approximation that we used wasn't that bad. And also, uh, we of course look at the, uh, the VCC FCC transition. Uh, and again, uh, so these are the, the predictions I showed you before. Uh, these are the predictions with the, uh, the molecular theory without incompressibility. The values are not exactly the same. We are still working. Uh, the, the reason is that the model we had to use for these two theories is a little bit different. But what is nice is that we get the FCC VCC transition in, 
in this case too. So we are happy with that. All right, so uh, I'm going to conclude with that. Uh, so uh, we, we did this molecular graph theory to try to look at uh, this solvent induced transition. Uh, something that I think is, is very nice to probably look at is, is this transition, but in other systems. So for example, in binary super lattices, uh, in the particular case where you had these long rods, it was interesting to see that uh, the transition occurred from something that was uh, hexagonal that would be close back if these were hard bodies to something that is uh, square. Uh, so I do believe that this may be something general here that probably may be also interesting to look at in binary super lattices. Uh, we also use the theory to look at the problem of trigonal distortions in um, non-spherical uh, nanoparticles. And right now, okay, we're working on, on a few other things related to also to, not going to show you anything about that. So for example, we are looking at um, some applications of this related with optics and uh, ion transport. But mainly the student that is working on this project is, is looking at, at, at uh, right now this issue of drying the system by controlling the amount of solvent. Uh, so this is uh, just, I want to acknowledge my, my research group and uh, mainly Leandro, who is the PhD student, and it's a brilliant PhD student that uh, this, all of this in a little bit more than three years. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mario, for this uh, theory talk. Any questions? Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's start. Please. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Um, I was wondering, can you also see or study the mechanism behind this transition from FCC to BCT? Is it a conformational entropy of the lichens or is it the the interaction between the nanoparticles. And what do you take for as a Haarmaker's constant when you evaporate the solvents? So yes, uh, regarding the first question, uh, sometimes difficult to understand the reason of the predictions. So for example, we look at the different contributions of, of the free energy. I can tell you the, the last one, the core-core the interaction is not very important. It's a balance between uh, the entropy of the solvent and the entropy of the ligand. And uh, when you apply this incompressibility constraint that you have to enforce it using uh, a Lagrange multiplier, there is uh, something else that shows up that is uh, basically the osmotic pressure that will prevent, of course, to, to keep uh, compressing the system. So you look at those contributions. Uh, but it's very difficult. It's, it's not really that all of them are, are mixed together and it's not that easy to assign uh, this transition to one of them. Uh, the way I like to think about that, even though, so we don't assume uh, any kind of pathways additivity here, okay? Uh, but I do still that you can explain a lot of this using just pathways additivity in terms of, of the interactions. So there is, uh, let me see, there are some potentials that actually predict this, this type of uh, transition. I think I had one of them. So, this is, for example, just looking at the different contributions, uh, the, the transition entropy of the solvent, the Hamaker, the entropy of the ligand. But all of that is convoluted. It's very difficult to tell something about that. But there are some papers that show, let me see if I have that here. Okay, for, for example, this one. Uh, this has some potential. Uh, actually predicts, and, and in fact, I, I look at our pairwise interac interactions as you just take it to particles and look it on that. And it's not, you can fit that interaction using this, this kind of uh, soft potential. And this potential actually predicts the transition from FCC to VCC when you increase the density of the system. So I, I do believe uh, you can think about that way. There are some potentials that predict the transition, some not. And uh, what we are doing just, uh, putting all, all the, what we know about the chemistry and, and the physics of the ligands there, and, and we get some sort of potential that predicts the, the transition. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And yeah. regarding, sorry, regarding the second question, we use a Hamaker parameter that's parameter for gold, gold uh, cores. 
Yeah, <clears throat> I had a question about your the ligand term in your uh, your free energy functional. If I understood it correctly, it is independent of the solvents, other than the solvent excludes volume. And so I, I, I'm wondering if you could say more about why that works seems to work so well, even though you'd expect the properties of the solvent to change the ligand conformational free energy quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. So, in the first theory that we made, uh, there is no solvent, um, let's say, ligand ligand effective interaction. And the reason for that is that, in general, if you think about the solvents that are used for these things, so for example, it exines as a solvent, uh, that's, a very, that's a good solvent for the alkanothiol ligand. So, in principle, you don't expect there to be an effective interaction. It's a good solvent, so it's no interaction. Uh, in the second model that I show you, we actually can control that, and that's something we want to do. So let's say now you take a solvent that is not a good solvent, or is it, of course, not, a bad solvent wouldn't work because that will always collapse the superlattice, but something in between, and you can look at the effect of that. That's something we want to do. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question here. And, and I would I would say uh, say your name and your affiliation every time so that also people online and the other people don't know you get your right name. So thank you, Mario, for the talk. My name is Tobias Kaus. I come from Germany, from INM, and I have a question on solvents and your methodology too. I'm not sure whether I got it correctly, but I mean there are, I guess, density fluctuations in the solvents, in particular, also in the vicinity of the ligands. I mean, in reality. And now, the way you treat it, um, when looking at solvent quality, I mean, does it capture it in a reasonable fashion, or? Is it, is it sufficiently covered, or is this something that plays a large role? Basically, how much can the solvent go into the shell? How does it pack, and so on? That would be, in particular, for short-range interactions, we believe, experimentally, an important factor. Is it captured? Uh, so, it does go into the ligand layer, has a density there. Yeah. We can predict how much is that. Uh, so, if you have any measurement, we can compare with that. Now, of course, uh, again, the way we treat the solvent and the ligand is a mean field approximation, yeah. so you don't, you, you lose a lot of packing effects there that you may have any simulation, right? But uh, on the other hand, these are thermodynamic predictions, so everything is by concentration equilibrated. So you assume it can be represented in the interaction potential, bas basically for the chemical potential alone, uh, even in, in short distances? I'm not sure what, what you I mean, basically, I guess what I'm asking is if you have, say, a linear ligand and the shell of linear molecules, right? And then yeah. you are really close so that the linear molecules start actually playing a role for both versus, say, something with a complicated structure, maybe even aromatic. I mean, this leads to complicated things, right? Is it, do you believe this is covered, can be covered that way, or? So, uh, it can be covered that way. Mm -hmm. so, so, let's say that you have a little, linear solid molecular exercise, your question is, is it going to interdigitate between yeah. the ligands or not? The answer is we, so we didn't do that. This is a very simple model uh, solvent, but we can do uh, a solvent with an internal structure. Mm -hmm. We can put all the conformations of the, uh, of that solid molecule, and then, of course, all the orientations, and then we can look at that and see if there is some uh, interpretation of not. And I, I do believe it's going to probably show some, some order based on other things we don't uh, in other systems. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tivo. Uh, Lisa Hall, Ohio State. So um, I was interested in, in basically the last thing you said. So I understood that um, you have a chemical potential, like you're not literally setting the, the density in the voids of the solvent, right? It's just the chemical potential that then corresponds to a density in the, in the bulk, right? So there's, there's uh, um, anyway, you're, you're setting the chemical potential of the solvent. And then, yes. and then when you think about drying it um, in the last part where you're saying maybe we can talk about maybe non-uniform drying through through a material, maybe we can have different boundary conditions. I was just interested in, in how you might approach that or how you are approaching that since you mentioned it. Well, basically what you do is, okay, so, so the first thing that I probably should have mentioned is all of this is thermodynamics, so we don't have kinetical effects in drying, right? So you fix a chemical potential, you look at how the solvent is distributed in the system. Of course, because the system is heterogeneous, the density of the solvent will be heterogeneous, so 
the density inside the ligand layer is different from the density in the void. Uh, and then you just start uh, decreasing the chemical potential and, and looking at this solution of the theory. And um, you may ask the question, okay, how much is the total amount of solvent you integrate over, over a lattice? But that, that's basically like what you are doing. But like at the very end, so I, I'm not gonna show you this last cool thing we're doing. And I was just curious about that. Mm -hmm. Like you said, there's like the, your very last bullet point of the whole thing. You said you're gonna look at drying, like- Ah, average. okay. Yeah, yeah. No, by, by drying, I actually mean this, uh, this effect. So, so this basically the question is, uh, it's actually this one. So how the solvent, how the, 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 the distribution of the solvent is as you dry, and by drying for us, it means decreasing the chemical potential of the solvent. Uniform. No, I mean the chemical potential is, is uniform, like right? yeah. thermodynamics. It should be constant everywhere. Yeah. It's just a number. But then we, we just take that number and, and decrease it and look at the distribution of the solvent. And not only that, because you, again, this, this you need to solve. You have to, first of all, get here, calculate the whole curve, find the minimum of the grand canonical free energy. That will be the equilibrium structure. Then you take the, that equilibrium structure and you plot the density of the solvent and see how it's distributed. And we did this just for this simple case, but there are a lot of things we, we want to do. Uh, so this is a solvent that is just a point particle. I mean, no internal structure, but uh, we want to have some internal structure to model exons, for example. I look at solvents, as I mentioned, that are not good solvents for the system. Uh, we can also look at other type of nanoparticles. I mean, there is a lot of things we, we can do with that. Uh, so I'm curious about your PCT transition, where you basically shown that different orientation have different interaction energy. But for, if I understand this correctly, you get the ligand confirmation for free back out from your calculation because you generate these, right? Mm -hmm. So have you looked at the density profile of that along these different directions to see how that then mediates the, the favoring of BCT over BCC? So basically what, what, yeah, we look at that. So basically what happens, maybe this plot is, so the, if you look at, at the density profile of the ligands when uh, the system is rather compressed, it's just a big size cell of, of the, has a shape that is corresponding to the Bigner uh, size uh, cell of, of the particular structure we are looking at. This is your FCC. So does you that change, mean, that change, right? Right, yeah, right. But that means that then you can engineer something like a bimodal brush to then favor the BCC and just have it partitioning differently, right? That, so you can take yeah. that idea from the Wittner seeds, translate that to a sphere. Yeah, that's a nice idea, yeah, yeah. of course. So uh, we have an, uh, so, uh, of course, so you first can engineer the, the shape of the inorganic core, that's probably easier. And as I, as I showed you before, that uh, will change, not only introduce the BCT phase, but also change the boundary stability between BCC and FCC. Uh, yeah, you probably can, can try to engineer in the legal layer and, and add something that will trigger. But of course, I mean, you have to be realistic here in the sense that everything you do to a legal layer should, should be homogeneous probably, right? I mean, on a spherical particle. So I don't know how that would work. But it's a nice idea, yeah. Other questions? Oh, let's. Yeah, hi, Chen from UC. A beautiful talk. I also have a question about the solving evaporation process. So practically in experiments, sometimes that's also effective by um, fluid dynamics effects, such as covering, for example. Uh, do you have plans to take those effects into account? Uh, no, not really, because again, this is uh, thermodynamics. So everything that, that is dynamically, dynamical, we cannot uh, have it here. Uh, there may be ways to address that, but we are not the argument. So the answer is not for now, maybe in 10 years. <laughs> Die, yeah, come back in the years and let you know. <laughs> okay, so Alex Traverset from Iowa State. Uh, thanks for this talk, it's beautiful work. Um, I have a question which is at the end, you have some predictions for uh, what are the free energies or difference in free energies in the dry state and also the lattice constant, uh, but you have not yet compared to the actual other estimates or it's just work in progress or? 
Yeah, this is work in progress. So we, we can talk more later, but I'm just. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know. I know that. So, so for example, the simulation, you get a, a little bit less than that. I, I think maybe 200 kT of something like that. Uh, this, of course, will depend a lot on, on the values that we use. And, of, for example, the lapis parameter will depend a lot of the size of the of the core. Uh, in general, we do particles that are a little bit smaller than in the experiments. Um, I think these are three nanometer uh, diameter nanoparticles, and we also change the the length of the ligands to match the lambda parameter, so it more or less stays in, in the same range as, as in the experiments. So for that reason, this this lattice parameter is maybe a little bit small. Uh, regarding the energy scale, uh, I don't know. It may have to do with the choice of so we. We choose the, the interaction parameters. Of course, this vulnerable interaction has an epsilon value, and we pick that in order to have a liquid uh, just a little bit below the critical temperature. So we, we do have a liquid gas transition. Maybe that's not. Maybe we pick it too below the, uh, the critical temperature. Uh, but still, I mean, the order of magnitude is, is not that far away from what no, you no. from simulation. So I think it's not bad. We can talk. Yeah, sure. It's beautiful. Thank you. Maybe also to mention there are also online participants. If you are online and you have a question, please raise your hands. We cannot at present see the chat, so if you type there, but we'll try to also see if there are questions online. Uh, yeah, Carlos is checking out if there's... Okay, any other questions from the audience? One has raised hand. Maybe maybe question also from my side. Can you go back to the slide where you have the, the, the model and the equations, the, the free energy equations? And maybe, I mean, this we have a lot of people also from experiment here, but maybe for, for those people that are not uh, uh, theoreticians, maybe say a bit which kind of information from the experiment you put into the model and where they enter into your, your, your different different equations. So what are the assumptions a bit, maybe the same okay. again. Uh, so First thing is that there is uh, a lot of things that don't show up here. So as I said before, uh, so let's say for example, the, the size of the particle, uh, the particle in organic core is exclude volume for the ligands and the solvent. So that basically goes into the boundary conditions of, of this problem, which are not here. Uh, but that's something we can control, the size of the particle. The length of the ligand, as I said you before, uh, there is a summation. Yeah, here that's over the, all the conformations. And we actually do have explicit conformation for the ligands, so we generate the ligands using some Monte Carlo algorithm. So there you can put uh, information like, uh, for example, the length of the ligand. Also, because we are modeling uh, hydrocarbons, we include this, this term here. So if you look at this one, this is just uh, a, a Gibbs uh, entropy equation, right? And this other contribution over here is an uh, energy uh, enthalpic uh, contribution from the Gauche trans uh, energy of, of hydrocarbons. So that's also there. Uh, that's a param even though that's a parameter, that, that Gauche trans energy is something that is known from experiments. And then you have the Hamaker constant of the inorganic cores. And it's in this other theory, you also have some Lennarsson parameter for the uh, Van der Waals interaction. I mean, most of that is all the information is something that is very straightforward to get from from most experiment, uh, from experiments. Uh, in this particular theory, we're still trying to to fix a little bit uh, a few parameters. But. Okay, okay, maybe just quick. And if people want to read more about this, which paper should they? So we have this. Uh, we published two papers on this. One is this one nanoscale that's related to the non-spherical particles and the problem of BCT. And we have another one. This is nano about the BCC FCC transition. Uh, yeah, this one we still don't have it ready. Okay, it's still more to work in progress. Okay, we are running out of time, unfortunately, but there will be time in the in the coffee for for any further questions. Thank, so, you. thank you very much.